No, thank you for asking me to join. I'm definitely that, uh, like happy to be here and I hope that our audience is really excited for this conversation just like I am. Um, so I think just to get started, how about you tell us about like the version of the background that uh, our audience is gonna need to understand the context of this evening. Right. Um, oh, so let's see, you know, I was born and raised in Kingston, Jamaica. And, you know, I'll shout that out every single time because I think it's, it's definitely the part of me that um, has helped me understand what it means to be, you know, a black man in America, but also an international person, someone that's an outsider and an insider at the same time. So I'll definitely, you know, point to that every chance I get. But, you know, ultimately growing up in Jamaica, I was, you know, academically proficient. And I went to Campion College, which was a top academic school in Kingston. Then I went to Lawrenceville, which was um, an elite boarding school in New Jersey. And I mentioned those because everything and everyone in my life supported art and it they sort of affirmed my talent, but they were always pushing me towards some kind of a traditional experience. You know what I mean? Um, so those intense classroom experiences kind of sharpened my research skills and they helped me develop a inquiry practice, which created the foundation for what I'm doing now. You know, so at a place like Davidson, which emphasizes an appreciation for knowledge acquisition, for critical thinking, it it was easy for me to feel like my time in the visual arts department was as rigorous, if not more maybe than some of the other departments on campus. You know, and um, I think what it did was it really taught me, and I think you can relate to this, it taught us how to sort of take a bunch of disparate information from a variety of sources and really put them into a cohesive language for others to engage and to sort of um, enter it. So, you know, through Art Studio and um, art history at Davidson, I uh, learned that, you know, art looks a certain way during each time period, not just because of the style, but because of the politics, the um, what kind of trade was available, um, what the social phenomena was, what the pop cultural moment looked like. And so that, you know, that for me was sort of a, a major part of recognizing where I was between 2011 and 2015, you know, being in Davidson, um, you know, a southern suburb that I was not used to and having to generate inspiration, you know, so that that experience for me was it was profound. And um, I would say that fortunately being at Davidson at a time when we only had four majors in my year, um, you know, that gave me, I was outnumbered by faculty and by resources, you know, so it gave me the art experience at a non-traditional art school that most mm -hmm. people would pay a lot of money for, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so I think you know, and having access to people like Brenda King at the front desk and Leah and Rosemary who were in the gallery at the time, um, you know, faculty like Court Savage and Tyler Starr, um, and then every single visiting artist, every single guest lecturer, every single person that was providing some kind of opportunity, you know, I had access to them and I was probably gonna be first in line because there were only so many of us. So, you know, by the end of junior year, I'm, I'm sure you know this is like, you're the artist on campus, you know, everyone knows that's what you do and they expect you to do it well. And so, you know, seeing that there was a certain energy around public art, you know, there um, with the spike grants, with Friends of the Arts really taking shape, with, um, you know, different sculptural projects coming, up, coming around on campus, I think it really planted the seed for what, you know, for the murals that sort of led us to this conversation today. And so, you know, for me, I think it's interesting with all that being said, you're hot off the press, you know, you're a freshly minted artist from Davidson. So can you tell us a little bit about your first encounter with public art? You know, was there a noticeable energy on campus and or did you have to go find it um, for yourself? Yeah, so um, being on campus, I already knew that public art was acknowledged, respected, um, and then like ingrained in the Davidson culture. We had a sculpture garden in the middle of our school in our campus. We had um, them sprinkled across our entire campus. A, tour dedicated to talking about the subjects and um, what they addressed. And so um, I started to understand that public art was just a great way for conversation and like a great way for people to enter it uh, that I not only found through research for community engagement and then like the impact of positive imagery, but then also um, how it plays a part in international conversation, but then opening up the doors to um, have different pieces of like engagement, uh, positive imagery, and then 
the perception that comes with uh, perspectives and how our identity plays on these different uh, public art projects, whether that's in mural, sculpture, whatever. Um, and then to me, when it came time to considering public art and murals in like the very general scope, uh, I thought that Davidson had a terrible habit of just like addressing issues as they came up, but then not continuing the conversation um, after they occurred. So like continuing that learning, discussing whatever. And then because of that, um, I wanted imagery to be more apparent and more reoccurring on campus um, and more visible, just consistently all the time and almost impossible to miss. Like you would have to go out of your way to see whatever it is, the conversation we're trying to have. Um, so I thought that the continuous experiences that I had as BIPOC at Davidson um, and then like the experiences that potentially like LGBTQ plus AI students had every day was something that needed to be consistently addressed and um, wasn't something that we could selectively talk about or, um, or learn about in the classroom. Like this was an experience that was lived every day. And so, um, when I began to develop my own project in addressing these topics, such as like racism and colorism, um, I knew it had to be a mural. Like I wanted to know that these different projects that were going on on campus, ones that were occurring on second uh, floor watts, the ones that were occurring in wall, um, you could go and see them, but I wanted this to be something that was placed very directly and visible and accessible to classrooms, to students, to visitors. So Chambers Lawn seemed like a great place because it not only was a direct gateway to students access to different buildings on campus, um, but the historical impact that that has knowing that Chambers family had a direct impact on enslaved persons on campus and um, owning people that lived on campus to then build the college. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I'm not even going to try to all of that, but yeah, you're <laughs> You know, murals are fun, but they, they're very much a part of that, that visual landscape, um, you know, within a variety of spaces, everything from revolutionary movements in, in Mexico City to, you know, critically acclaimed installations in American museums and, you know, all the way to the beautification projects of every gentrified city in America right now. Um, you know, we see murals and we see street art and we see things that, you know, people have left their mark, you know, in public and it's usually massive and it's usually eye-catching, right? So mm -hmm. um, I personally did my first mural thanks to an opportunity that came up while I was on campus in the summer before I went abroad. So I did that over in the Black Student Coalition um, house. And let me just share my screen here so we can, you can see what's going on. Um, so yeah, I got the chance to paint that mural and you know, I didn't tell them this at the time, but it was the first the first mural I was paid to make. And so that in itself becomes, becomes its own challenge, you know, where you're trying to, you're trying to really figure out, um, you know, where, where you, where you can take certain liberties with your creative expression, but then you know that people are going to see this and they, they want it to mean something. Right. So yeah. this mural, you know, I made it, it was called mind the gap. And a lot of that was around sort of, joining forces across the, the various boundaries we had on campus, you know, and the most obvious one is always going to be race because that's visual for us. Um, so that was important. And then I would say, yeah, the next one I did was I went to Prague after studying abroad. Um, I went back there in the summer, right? And I got to do a, a mural there. And this was just me really loving graffiti and loving street art and pushing. Like I had to beg them to let me do this. And in the final week, they were like, all right, fine, we found a space for you so you can get to it. Um, so those two experiences really, you know, really cemented the fact that this is what I was gonna be doing. You know, like it was time to sort of go after it. So I'm curious, you know, when did you make your first mural? Was it this, was it the mural panel project that we collaborated, collaborated on or was it something else? Um, yeah, so my first mural was the mural panel project. <laughs> Um, like an interactive piece dedicated to fostering conversation on topics that prevented the Davidson College community as I existed in it um, from being as its optimal self as being the most inclusive space it could be. Um, and so I did, I conducted research to figure out that those, um, those topics that we wanted to address were racism, colorism, homophobia, 
and classism. And so considering all of those topics as outlined by students, faculty, staff, and alumni, um, I, the idea first came up uh, at a rally that was after the removal of two neo-Nazi students at Gates in the fall of 2019. And I was sitting at a table in the union, one of the high top tables, and I was sitting right across from my then boss mentor and Davidson mom, Sherry Nelson. And I was just sitting in this space, uh, trying to understand why we were having this conversation again. Like uh, this is something we had been experiencing starting my freshman year in 2016 um, with the shooting of Keith Lamont Scott. And um, I was just confused on why we we're still here continuing this conversation one more time. And um, I said, you know what, we need a space where we have this reminder all the time that um, we experience, like we, I guess, as in BIPOC, and then also like speaking for myself, um, just experience this consistent space of wondering and questioning my space at Davidson. Um, and that needs to be a continuous conversation, not something that we just do because this happens. Um, I'm like, it should be done as a mural. It's like, let's do it. Okay. And I was like, okay. Um, and so first of all, I had never painted that large. So this idea was just a one-off kind of thing. Um, and then all of a sudden I was able to gain all of the support and um, guidance on how to use a spray can from local Charlotte artists, uh, John Harrison Jr. Um, I was given people to connect with, like you, um, and how do you even do a mural? Um, I was able to ask various Charlotte-based artists on what a mural project looks like. Um, and then also based on different warnings from um, trusted advisors, like what a permanent installation at campus looked like. Um, and then like also just the ideas behind an initial response, just like a base response wall, which was what I thought of initially. Um, and then fears of like vandalism, hate speech and um, like racist comments. But my thing was like, if that's the worst that comes from this project, then I did my job. Like I know uh, we've connected on this a lot and the fact that any conversation that comes from art is that's like, that's it. That's the goal. That's exactly what we're trying to do. Um, and so if I'm able to evoke an emotional response, whether that's positive or negative or wherever it's coming from, um, to foster an ultimate conversation of why that response is the way it is, then what else, what is this all for? So um, like that thought process came directly from discussions with professors, with other art students, um, and then just like other creatives in general. So I guess I'm just wondering, like, I know that for me, the project really threw me into um, what my senior capstone ended up discussing. So I'm just wondering like how, um, your project overlapped with or like influenced your personal experience um, and then your artistic practice at Davidson? Yeah, um, you know, for me, it was my project that was with fall 2014. That happened at a time where I was just obsessed with figuring out how to make the biggest, most epic paintings that could somehow tell a story, you know, about where I was from and my people and our stories. And so you know, I was, I was dead set on this sort of like Jamaican painting style that was gonna compensate for all the years of art history that never focused on the Caribbean, that never focused on, you know, it needs to be like in the African diaspora in the, in the US. I mean, I took an African-American art history class my junior year. That was the first time I had seen like black art in a textbook, right? My junior, yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> So for me, you know, it was like, all right, how do you negotiate the difference between painting on a street where it's technically illegal, you know, there might be cops coming at you or you're on some high scaffolding, um, you're using spray paint, you don't have time to sort of clean it up. You don't have time to, you know, get in there and like refine it the next day because you saw the spot, you know, once the scaffolding comes down, it's done. So I had four mm -hmm. days and for me, it was speed and the, the visual, right? Like I had to get it done. So um you know, that was one aspect of it. And then trying to figure out how that was gonna come back to my studio where I had, you know, my feet on the ground firmly. I had privacy, I had my books, I had my sketchbooks. Um, you know, it was easy to sort of really think through and pursue, you know, what I thought was perfection. But, you know, hearing you talk about your project, I realized that, you know, for me, a lot of it was just kind of technical, formal concerns. 
I didn't, I don't remember having the same kind of pressure or even like motivation to, to get into a social commentary space. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Ferguson happened summer of 2014 for me. So that was like August 10, the first protest because um, Mike Brown was shot on August 9th. And, you know, other cities followed the trend with the protests. Charlotte definitely had its, um, its own version of, um, you know, uprising. And on campus, you know, there were students sort of organizing and they had events and, you know, whether it was a vigil or um, I think there was like a, like a sit-in at some point, you know, we had like a, a mini march, you know, stuff like that was happening, but it definitely didn't have the same kind of urgency and energy that we would see, um, that would see show up in the, in the recent years, especially led by groups on college, college campuses, right? So, you know, for me, I think looking back, maybe my... I don't want to call it like willful ignorance, but it was probably more like a self-preservation thing, you know, where let me not get too deep into this in my senior year while I was trying to focus on like, you know, developing myself, but being able to take time and space for yourself in that kind of moment is its own kind of defiance, right? Because I'm alive, I'm unharmed. Um, and at that time, the biggest threat, you know, that we're discussing is police and unarmed black men. So for me, being able to get up on a scaffolding and paint and in the middle of a college campus that typically would not allow something like this, you know, it, and granted, I had to go through certain, you know, hoops to get permission and, you know, sorry, Sherry, but I didn't even go with the image that I submitted. I, I changed it the day of. So, you know, that in itself for me was, was my own sort of space to take and to claim. And it only seemed right, you know, um, there, there's a way in which, there's a way in which I, you know, I could try to verbalize all the things I was thinking at the time. I definitely have some gems hidden in there that was maybe poking at Davidson and how I felt about the space at the time. You know, we can talk about that off camera. Um, but, you know, more or less, I realized that that mural for me was sort of my way of standing on the shoulders of the artists that came before me. So 2013 summer, um, Ambrose Miller had just done her mural. Um, um, I think it was called, uh, yeah, here it is. Chances are she did that in the multicultural center in the union. But unless you were a part of those spaces, you know, unless you were black or brown or somehow internationally diverse or whatever it was, you might never have gone into that room. You know, you might never have seen that mural. And so I thought, okay, cool. One person got to do it on campus in a relatively prominent space. I want to go do it on the biggest place, right? And that semicircle above the union, you know, nothing was there. It's like they made it begging for a mural and they just never put it in. So I think that was, you know, it was, it was supposed to happen this way. But then, you know, you came along and you sort of took that and, you know, you ran on and sort of put yours front and center in the middle of the lawn. And so, you know, for me, I was very, I wouldn't say I was like concerned about it, but I was curious what was going to happen when people didn't know who made the mural, you know, you're on campus at a time when you do a cool project and everyone wants to know what you were thinking and your friends are super excited and strangers are stopping you and your head starts to swell a bit, right? But on the, at the same time, I was thinking, well, this thing has to be so good that when I'm not here, it lives on and it can, it can still inspire some kind of, you know, action or conversation or just pleasure. And so, you know, with you being on campus, when your project was sort of having its course and run, you know, living its life. I'm curious what that was like for you, you know, to sort of be there and be a part of the, the discourse that it was meant to actually generate. Yeah. Um, so it's funny, actually, in my, in that moment of Sherry, I want to do this. Um, she pointed at your mural and said, oh, well, Stevie Robertson class of 2015 did that one. So I don't see why not. Um, and I was like, so, yeah, I definitely, um, I felt that connection for sure. Um, and I think about um, being on campus with my project. It was really cool to experience um, because I got to watch not only my, my own perspective, my own identities as a black woman, like a black girl, um, be exhibited on a large scale that I hadn't seen at Davidson very regularly. Um, going back to what you said about art history, I very, I very rarely saw black women in art history. Um, and so to then see uh, my like my own work, but then also like my own face reflected in public art around me and in a space that I had that I was occupying currently was very important to me, but then also to showcase 
to other people. So to people on campus. Um, and then now as I do work out in Charlotte, knowing that there's other girls, other women that are watching me and what I do um, has been like extremely impactful. And just being able to share that experience um, with those who get in and th also those who don't. Um, and being able to be a part of that conversation actively. So like had knowing that the mural panel project was a part of classroom discussions, that it was brought up um, during different DEI or diversity and equity inclusion programming um, and understanding that it wasn't just my perspective as a black student being shared, but like an experience of BIPOC um, and a history of erasure and um, understanding that we're, like you said, we're standing on the shoulders of um, the people before us. And just knowing that that representation, that imagery of a narrative not regularly discussed on campus um, was given space in such a prominent space. Um, I would like just walk past it and just like, wow, <laughs> that exists. Um, and I think that that's something that uh, isn't really like actively discussed, especially when um, that recognition is given so actively and like that acknowledgement is given um, in these very prominent spaces. Um, so I got a ton of positive feedback from the project, um, not only from like Davidson faculty, community members, um, and other students on just like what it does, the uh, way that it was able to incorporate in different conversations. Um, just like the guidance that I was able to receive and then give to other people was just immaculate. Um, like how I, the idea in and of itself was able to evolve um, and spread into Charlotte. So it's moved to the front steps of the Levine Museum. And, um, and now it's at Charlotte Country Day, which is my current job. But also knowing that students who I'm still relatively close with because of our age group, um, like for example, Adele Patton, knowing that um, her and also TJ Elliott have been working on a project that also plays upon public art and installation is just huge because I know that um, just having that connection, also being able to connect so directly has been so exciting um, to provide that type of guidance. Um, and just knowing that this work is just a continuation of everything that has happened before us. So starting in like the 1970s with um, Jimmy Newell's mural in the gray room, like the game room that was once uh, part of the, that was in, oh my gosh, I'm blinking on the building. Anyway, I just know that there's a mural there. Um, and then in the 19, uh, in the 1990s, in like 1995, when uh, Mary Beth Crawford did a mural, um, like you said, Ambrose Miller in 2013, and then you in 2015, um, and just knowing that the differences that are coming onto Davis's campus with uh, public art and how that's being utilized uh, in these um like disruptive spaces like such with projects uh with like Nor uh, Maurice Norman and like I mentioned Adele and TJ um is just like knowing that that's their place for as a medium for conversation is just so exciting to watch um and then knowing also that the college is supporting us financially in these endeavors is really exciting um uh, because uh like with my grants I know that the spike grant also supported you um and then even with the Davis and Room mural that I was able to complete this past fall, um, how exciting it can be to just get that outright support and how energizing that is not only to my craft, but then like the things that I choose to do. And it confirms that my medium is impactful, it's important, and it's meaningful. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, there's nothing like getting paid to do what you do best. Um, you know, honestly, I would say, you know, especially having gone on to teach right after, well, not right after, but within the years after Davidson, you know, hearing the conversations that you all are having now. And, you know, I had sophomores and juniors that were like putting me on blast because I wasn't up to speed with the kind of energy they had when it came to calling out institutions, when it came to like checking, you know, people who on different days they look up to and admire because they're their teachers and coaches and whoever else. But, you know, when the time comes, they're going to check them. And so I thought, wow, you know, for me, all my conversations about making art on campus or the murals, it was, it was way more about the beauty and the pleasure of the work. Right. And I think it sounds like your experience had a lot more to do with what's the messaging, the consequences and the potential like charge that would come out of it. Um, and so I, you know, I, 
I genuinely think that, you know, I had a great experience because of what I got to do, but it seems like, you know, you had your own sort of rewards that came with it. Um, and I would also sort of, you know, go back to what you're saying about, you know, having something like the spike grant that could sort of fund my version of the project and then your version, and then you are able to go on and get even bigger support from the school. Um, we know medicine is lucrative. We know that law and econ and all the other courses that people sort of gravitate towards because of the career, right? Yeah, they know that they're going to be able to do well. But um, I think for us, having institutions like Davidson, having, um, you know, the local museums, whether it's the Harvey Gantt or the Mint or, you know, McCall Center, like down there in Charlotte, you know, these places need to be looking out and finding young artists, you know, um, and saying, look, we got you. We're going to give you some space to sort of experiment and to, to test the waters. And then based on the work you're doing in school, we're going to go ahead and give you, you know, that year of commitment right after so that you don't feel like you're struggling to sort of, you know, chase your dream or find a day job, you know. And I think, I think for me, I, you know, back to that sort of super academic training that I had, there, there, I don't think there's a single Caribbean child that whose parents aren't telling them education is the key, get the job, you know, whatever it is, like secure the bag, as we would say. There's a way in which I, that was at odds with art for me, you know. Um, and luckily I met, um, you know, big dog Jim Nash over in Duke Performance Hall. Um, he, was, he was incredible with helping me with the union um, project. And then um, sort of, he connected me with a guy named Tim Parati down at the Children's Theater of Charlotte. And, those experiences, you know, got me to really see what it was like to put my put my like skills to day to day work. You know, I'm painting in a theater where the people around me, they either did certificate programs at community colleges, they, you know, they might have had like a first degree in some other thing, but they liked art. So they went to go help do set design or, you know, build, build a set, you know, doing the carpentry, stuff like that. But I didn't get to go into that space. And, you know, as the the fresh liberal arts grad, you know, I had to go in and like earn my stripes. I had to show them I could paint, I could build, I can follow orders, I can, you know, match colors, I can sort of scale up a very small design. And that puts a certain level of rigor into your practice, you know. Um, and so I think I'm, I'm not upset that I had to do that, but I definitely sought that out because I didn't think I was going to get to pursue, you know, fine art outright, which then led me to getting my, you know, my teaching degree. And so now with my MFA, I'm probably overqualified as a entry level sort of college teaching, you know, role because I didn't know what was going to happen. So I had to make sure that I, I doubled down and got all the necessary qualifications, which is fine, but not everyone has the time to, to get an MFA and do two years of, you know, teacher education, whatever it is. So yeah, paying and supporting the artists now to sort of to innovate and to experiment and to, to collaborate, you know, had you not gotten enough funding, I couldn't have gone out to Charlotte to, you know, come up to Davidson to help you out. We might not have had certain conversations, which, you know, built up this relationship we have, which started off as more like mentor mentee. Now we're just homies talking about art, you know, so there's many, there are a lot of ways that you can never write in an application or in some kind of proposal of how the support is really going to benefit the artists um, in question, but I'm happy that you're proof that this is sort of, you know, I did it one way, you got to sort of have tough conversations and push the art and are still being supported by it. So whoever's coming behind you, I'm, I'm super excited for what they're gonna do. Um, and so, you know, a lot of this also comes back to this summer, you know, we, um, we all, we're all very aware of, you know, March through, through June, through August, through now, and, you know, whether it was, George Floyd or Breonna Taylor or Tony McDade or Ahmaud Arbery, you know, the, you name it. Artists are being called upon to respond to these moments the entire time, right? Like, and no one's saying, hey, here's a, here's a house to stay in for the month while you're working in this place. No one's saying, here's some cash to get your groceries and to, to, you know, like do some meditation or some yoga. It's, we're out there cutting time out of our days, right? So that we can go paint. And so, you know, I'm happy to be a part of the movement happy to, to lend my talents to the cause, but, you know, the funding I got from this program down in, um, down in Palo Alto, it was nice, it covered materials, but that was time out of my studio that I could have been using to make work that I was gonna go sell for way more money, you know, but 
when we have this mission and we're being called, it's kind of what you have to do to get the job done. Um, so, I, you know, it's, I'm curious how you feel now, you know, and I know you did your own, you, you were a part of a project um, down in Charlotte as well. And um, I forget which letter you did. Let me see if I can find it here. Is it the V? Yeah, okay. Um, you know, you, you are also a part of this and you get to rub shoulders with other artists, but at the same time, it's a very specific purpose for the image, right? It's the it's social commentary, it's activism, it's resistance. And I'm curious, you know, how you feel now about this, um, this act of mixing or creative pursuits with or intellectual questions with, um, or, you know, or calls to action. And like, you know, do you think your work is driven by mission and should it be driven by mission? And, you know, how much of that do you, you let into your studio space? Yeah, um, so I've, I've been grappling with this question a lot. Um, just thinking about how art has played a role in my existence as a person in general, like it is ingrained in me. Um, and it is also the way that I express myself emotionally. Um, and so it's the way I process everything that's going on around me. And so it's hard sometimes for me to separate the two, especially once we bring finances into the conversation, um, when it comes time to selling work, when it comes time to um, just like doing things for a bigger purpose. And so when I think about uh, like, what is my moral responsibility as an artist, I know that there's several different pieces to it. Um, and I'm continuously asking my students the same question of, when you're using your voice, when you're using a medium that um, really connects with you so deeply, um, know, like understand what you're saying and like know why you're saying what you're saying or how you're saying it, um, because it's more than just, it's more than just a that's out in the world. Like, um, for example, for, the, for that build for with Joe Biden, um, I know that that was more than just a build. Like that was, um, that was something that's a staple. Like that's something that I can now showcase to like my kids and say, hey, there is this moment in history where we had an opportunity to be a part of something bigger than just um, like me sitting on my iPad drawing digital art. Like I got to be a part of a moment. Um, and granted, that's a whole, yeah, I was about to get into something that's a whole other conversation, but back to the finance part, like, yeah. Um, I think it's important that when we are part of these movements, like when artists are called upon to be those humanitarian documenters, um, you know, people open their purse uh, because it's it's more than just uh, it's more than just art at that moment. Like if you go to the next one, um, being part of these larger projects uh, is also like labor intensive, but then also like emotionally taxing. Like this is a point where um, I'm calling upon um, my own identity and then saying, and like laying it bare, like giving everything that I have to, um, to like an audience that doesn't necessarily know me, could potentially relate, could potentially not, um, but like putting my heart and soul out into the universe and then saying, hey, and, um, and I've grappled with how that should be um, compensated. And I think that we look at that really interestingly in the art world of like, what does that look like? Um, like, what does it look like to monetize a skill set like this, um, where you are showcasing human emotions? Um, and so just, yeah, just like being more conscious of like what that is and just like continuously asking myself why and like asking my students, well, why, well, why, well, why? Um, and I'm just wondering like, when you're asking yourself these whys, like, why are you doing all of this? Um, like, have you found a way for it to fit into like everything you've learned and developed from your MFA program? Yeah, I mean, that's loaded, you know. Um, so this is the kind of stuff I was making before the program. You know, it was very much sort of a continuation of those questions. Um, you know, how do I depict Jamaica? How do I, how do I sort of bring Caribbean culture into, into the contemporary art space? And so, you can see that there's some clear references back to like Italian um, Renaissance art with my arches and the gold. And, you know, so I wasn't, I wasn't gonna throw away all the stuff I had learned from a more Eurocentric um, background, but I was definitely trying to figure out how to bring, you know, what was relevant to me into the conversation. And that was all before doing the MFA. And I think, you know, I started to generate some work that had to move away from the, the typical representation because I didn't know where to think. 
it wasn't even how to do it. It wasn't really um, if you if you know how to make a thing. It was more so like what are the materials? You know, where are you? Who are you talking to? And I think you know I'm excited for when you take that next step in your own studio practice um, when you really have to grapple with these things because you realize how easy it gets to crank out these murals because they're fun and you know the imagery. And I'm not saying like, well, I, I, I am saying, I'm saying it's not the best work you're gonna make because you got years <laughs> of it, right? Um, but for me, some of these pieces, I had to really go back to like trash. I had to go back to like, you know, what kind of stuff am I finding in the street? You know, thinking back to Southern artists like Thornton Dial, you know, he, he was using like burnt out tires and, you know, um, People like Noah Purefoy after the Watts riots in, in Los Angeles, he's using like the wood from the houses that got destroyed and they're piecing together things and creating this sort of vernacular in the way that, um, you know, you might have like African-American vernacular compared to like traditional classroom English where we know all the slang, we know what everything means. I had to learn that because I'm coming from Kingston, right? So it's not natural to me, I had to learn it. But we, you find a way to sort of start like reckoning with what is what is our history and then what is your practice so for me during the mfa and now it was very much about like our what traditions exist you know so if we're thinking about portraiture you know you make a lot of portraits um some of your images the the figures are starting to get cut and sliced and you know so on and so forth and it's funny that we have a similar sort of thing going on you know even though we are just text heavy what i'm thinking here about um you know do you need to see my face to really appreciate that it's a portrait? You know, is there something about the way my mouth moves? Is there something about, you know, um, my jawline? Like, you know, that's a self-portrait. And if you know me, then you know it is. But if you don't know me, then maybe not, right? So, you know, what is it about the way that we represent ourselves in the world and the way that we carry ourselves in the world that's going to really communicate to an audience that has no idea where that's coming from? You know what I mean? So, um, I think it's very important that we recognize that, look, in the place that we're in, which is the United States of America, we are politicized. You know, our bodies are unfortunately at times moving targets. The way we talk might make us a moving target. You know, you, you haven't heard my Jamaican accent once tonight because I've learned how to code switch and keep it straightforward. But, you know, there are times when it comes out and you have to sort of embrace it and, and make sure that you know how to move in your space. And I think for my MFA, and even now I'm learning to just be comfortable and I'm learning to just sort of, you know, use the things that are important to me and use the things that, that my mom might recognize or my grandma might be able to, to appreciate and then figure out how to elevate it, you know, but without, without limiting them from entering the conversation. And so, you know, I think that's sort of, you know, we can end it here, but that's one of the things I've appreciated about sort of connecting with you is that we both went to Davidson, um, you know, you're you're a track track athlete i i did it in high school for a little bit and coached it in high school um we both have spent way too many hours in the vac um <laughs> <laughs> we love painting with spray paint but also have a studio practice where we're exploring you know digital um, photography collage um you know photoshop digital manipulation what it comes back to a conversation like this on a random thursday in december and so you know I'm excited for where this is going to go, but I also want, you know, anyone else seeing this to understand that, look, you know, whatever your junior and sophomore year were to you, you, you can use your senior year in a significant way and it can be that launch pad, you know? Um, so yeah, you know, it's, it, unfortunately I didn't get to have my, like my reunions and stuff back in, back in May and June, you know, whenever it would have been, but this is, this is a pretty nice way to sort of, you know, reconnect with Davidson. So I'm glad we could do this here. For sure, Zeus. Yeah. Um, I'm just gonna add on to, uh, especially with my studio practice within the last, um, I'm gonna just say like seven months. We'll just say seven months. Um, I wasn't able to have my senior gallery exhibition rip, but it's fine because from that, it like that from not being able to do that, I had to force my like almost force myself like I need to make stuff that like just it deserves to be in a gallery like I wasn't able to put my senior stuff into a gallery well shoot I'm gonna make everything that should be and um and it's been really cool to watch myself and then like also talk to you about that practice and and pushing those mediums um and 
I'm also going to go way back to when you're mentioning like just portraiture, that idea of portraiture. Uh, a lot of the portraits I'm also starting to develop and work with are, um, like you said, like cut up, chopped up. And because I think um, almost in a similar scope, like we as people in general, as human beings, um, our identities are just layering in and on top of one another where we just interact consistently. Like we're just consistently interacting with spaces that we in we inhabit um people we're interacting with and then also just like how we're feeling in that current day and we're not always this person like sometimes i'm her like sometimes that's me um and then sometimes i'm not but i'm a mixture of all of it um and so i think that like just exhibiting and feeling every piece of that is chopped like it's not always consistent it's not always seamless um and so I've really thought of that about that a lot through identity and what that looks like in portraiture and what that looks like in drawing and spray paint and um, and how and across every medium that can showcase and that can come out. Um, and so I've really taken that into my next steps or like how I see myself moving forward. Um, so I guess like as a little plug slash updates, you know, um, I have some work that's supposed to be going up on uh, the windows of the Harvey Gantt Center, um, a digital manipulation project that I did with photographer Alvin Jacobs Jr., whose work I believe is up in the gallery right now, um, or it was. Uh, and so that's been a really exciting thing. I'm just like, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for it to be unveiled um, because I just, I can't wait to see it so big. Like, I've, you know how when you picture work big, but you haven't seen it big? And then you finally get to see it big. So like, I'm excited for the moment. Um, I have some work that I'm getting ready to install in a gallery space very soon, actually like Saturday. So that'll be exciting. Um, and you and I have talked about this very often of just like going back to school. So I'm in a fellow position right now. So I'm, I'm like assistant teaching, but I would love to get a master's degree. And uh, I have thought of, and I've like been thinking about fine arts, but I've also been thinking about urban design and what that looks like with um, art placemaking, but then also in the construction and like just pouring into communities that have been displaced consistently and what it looks like to do these making projects, but um, with that community in mind um, and like, yeah, just projects like that. Uh, and so I'm just wondering, like, what, like, what's up? Like, what do you, what do you have going on? What's next? Um, I'm taking a break. I'm, I'm in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> I am fully committed to just making it happen, you know. So I'm, I'm at, um, the Headlands right now, out in the Headlands Center for the Arts, out in San Francisco, just across the Golden Gate Bridge. So that's where my, that's kind of my sanctuary right now. Um. And then in January, I'll have the residency at the space program where I'm getting back to some form of public art with my large metallic pieces. And um, I'll be over at the Kala um, Art Institute as well, working on some printmaking. So really trying to figure out some pattern making and some wallpaper stuff for the, for the backgrounds of the figures that I'm working on. So, you know, trying to find a way to piece together a lot of things, but no, for the most part, it's decompressing, um, forgetting all the stuff I don't need for my MFA, um, building on the things that I do want to keep and yeah just looking forward to you know maybe a collab or something with you going forward you know it is what it is with the pattern in the um wallpaper I have I'm exploding with ideas right. so I definitely I definitely see some of the work <laughs> all right cool well I think we should open up for a quick Q&A here see Judith is nodding um, <laughs> I'm gonna stop my screen share, but um, yeah, thanks for thanks for you know chopping it up with me a little bit. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Wow, uh, Michaela and Stuart, I I don't think I can share share my gratitude and appreciation for the dialogue that we all just were able to witness. Truly, that was um, it's it's inspiring to listen to both of you, and that would be a, a gracious understatement. <laughs> um, I do, your conversation has, it's, it's evoked several questions. And, and so just a reminder to those listening, you are welcome to send more questions uh, via the chat to me um, or to Hannah Jacob, either one of us. Um, but um, I do have some questions and I'm just gonna throw them out to both of you and let you decide who, who and how you wanna answer. 
Um, so the first question says, um, Wheel and Come Again, wonderful and beautiful mural. Some of Stuart's works contain accumulations from household waste. Are you artists, are you artists aware of Thurman Statham, excuse me if I didn't say that correctly, of Omaha, a glass artist who uses items from memory in his glass sculptures? I am uh, not. Yeah, I'm not aware, but the the language itself and sort of that that mode of making is pretty familiar. So, you know, I'm not I'm not surprised. And thank you for you know the compliment. Um, yeah, accumulation is definitely a big part of the way I work. It's you know I've lived in I've lived in Northeast for five years. Um, I've lived in North Carolina for five years. Been on the West Coast now for two going three years. So there is this. And then, you know, that's in addition to all my time back in Kingston. So there is this sort of layering of experiences and perspectives and the people that come into life um, that I meet and that I, you know, the ones that I hold on to or let go of and the mentors and, you know, people like Michaela and, you know, everything, you know, all the projects you do. So, yeah, there is this sort of accumulative um, experience that at some point you have to distill, but that's very much like how I work and how I think through it. It's all in layers. So, you know, I think that's a very apt sort of observation, yeah. You can also talk about how your studio is organized by bins. <laughs> yeah, the, it's it's a little cleaner now, but you know, I used to have, okay. <laughs> I used to have everything from like, you know, I'm with my, I'm with my wife, Miera. She also went to Davidson class of 2014. And when she moved out to California, there, there was a, a week where she was very confused, but very quickly it was, no, don't throw away that, that toothpaste wrapper. Don't throw away that bottle that you drank out of. Don't throw away the egg cartons. Like, I need that for work. And so really, it really got to a, you know, uh, maybe a um, fire hazardous sort of space for a little bit. Um, but it was necessary. You know, I had to figure out, like, what was going to be my new paintbrush? What was going to be my new paint? You know, because I wasn't working in a traditional way. So there, there is a lot of household debris. And I think, you know, years on, I'll be able to look back and say, okay, yeah, that was very specific to Palo Alto in Northern California during the years 2018 to 2020. And, you know, sort of as an artifact of my own life, what this moment in contemporary art where that was relevant. Thank you. Um, next question. Um, Wall art is some of the earliest art, cave paintings, frescoes, et cetera, now public art murals. Do you think shows like graffiti at the Brooklyn Museum in the mid 2000s helped to legitimize what had been an illegal art form or mode of expression? Whoo, that's funny because I just had a recent conversation about this whole topic of just, well, that, that whole topic of um, the impact that I guess like the art world has on um, mediums that are considered like either illegal or just like aren't seen as art forms. Um, and I often think a lot about how um, it often takes the legitimization of our world to say that something is an art form. Uh, for example, I think about literally every avant-garde movement ever where people are like, hey, I don't wanna just paint, I wanna do collage. And the art world says, no, gross, ew. And then all of a sudden, next thing you know, there's a whole movement dedicated to collage or the whole movement dedicated to abstraction to um, dismantling things because we, uh, there's a consistent system that's established that says, no, it's X, Y, and Z, that's art. Um, and so when we think about graffiti and street art, um, I think the cool thing about it is historically, um, it's supposed to be a medium of remembrance and also just kind of like, um, uh, like, like a post-it note, like we're here. I'm here, we exist, I exist, and it's in this space. Um, and here's how you can remember, it's just graffiti. Um, it's fast and it's quick, but it also has a lot of meaning in those ways. And so um, to have it legitimized by, um, by being put into a gallery space also begs the question of like, okay, well then, um, like, so what is fine art? Like when you're bringing in such a, um, such a quick, fast medium, and sorry, I'm gonna go on a tent, like this is a tangent a little bit, but I also think of like Banksy, he sold a piece uh, at an auction and then it got shredded halfway, like as soon as it was bought, it got shredded. Um, and then, so then just like how graffiti has been used um, as a medium of like, but then also 
yeah, just the purpose of legitimizing it to make it seem like a like a real art form. When in actuality, I think like any form of expression in whichever way it comes in uh, creatively is like is legitimate. Like that's a really great way to just showcase yourself. Um, and so I'm not sure if that answered the question or not, but yes. <laughs> Stewie's like, yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, thank you. Um, I know we're at time, we have a couple more questions. So our, if you are willing to hang in, Stewie and Mikhail, I'm happy to answer this for, for anyone who wants to, to remain on the call. Um, wood murals outside will last, but for how long? Rain, weather, so will there come a day when the, wor the works can be resembled on a large interior, wall, interior walls of public buildings on the campus, museums, et cetera? Here in DC, the Smithsonian African American Museum of History and Culture wants the plywood mural art along Black Lives Matter Plaza in front of Lafayette Square and the White House in the future as the city returns to peaceful existence. Um, um, oh, go ahead, you got it. So yeah, that sounds more like a comment, but yeah, you know, it, it's gonna it's gonna go, and but that's a tradition, you know, so. Sort of piggybacking off of Michaela's response, the art world does this thing where it commodifies very interesting things and someone else that has the means and the capital can sort of determine how it exists in the world. And that's kind of the problem, right? Is, you know, I'm talking about using household waste. Um, the guys that were climbing trains back in, you know, Brooklyn in the 80s and the 70s doing their graffiti, you know, here up in, um, up in Harlem, wherever it was, they weren't thinking, oh, I need this work to last forever. They were putting it on trains because it was going to travel around the city. Someone was going to see the work and it, they were going to get recognized for it. And they were fully committed to going back out the next night and the next night and the next night to put up more work because it's supposed to be susceptible and vulnerable to the elements, right? But we have this sort of tendency now within the art world to sort of make things last forever so that we can attach a value to it so that the person who owns it can maintain control of that value. So, you know, we do want to document everything that's happened around the artistic components or the artistic support for the, the Black Lives Matter movements and any other sort of social justice, whether it's for, you know, queer communities, um, women, um, indigenous peoples, whoever it is, right? We want those things to last, but at the same time, if that goes to the Smithsonian, who is getting um, compensated for it? When you take down that plywood off Black Lives Matter Plaza, are they going to go find the artists that made it and give them an official credit for having work in a collection of the Smithsonian? Are you going to go ahead and give them their stripes for having, you know, put their, their lives on the line when you really think about it, right? Because the police could have come at any point in time still. So, you know, it's, I get it and I fully support preserving and sort of conserving the art that exists. But if you go ask the people that started this movement, they didn't mean for this stuff to live forever. You know, it's really about being here and sort of joining in the energy and the conversation that's present. So that that's a tricky one for me, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, and just to go off of that, I agree. It's, I make everything, even now, like stuff that's on canvas, I, I make it with the intention and uh, ultimate relief that it will, it will not last forever and it will probably go somewhere else, be thrown out, broken, um, torn up like it and I'm okay with that just like every knowing that um I put the energy into making it and that I was able to experience it in its most like prominent and then also like newest form is fantastic and that's really the only memory that I need to live with like speaking from a personal experience um even with the Jameson weight room mural uh, I know that there's plans to make a new weight room so I know that that weight room will not last forever but for the moments that people get to experience it, exist with it, and then recognize that it was there and like know that it was there. Like I got to lift when that weight room mural was there. Like that's a moment that people really hang on to and will stick with. And I think that's something that's also extremely important. So yeah, art isn't gonna last forever, but like, that's cool. And that's okay. It's about um, the emotions that you feel and then the experiences that you have remembering and knowing that it was there. Awesome. Um, I know we're past time, so I'm just going to try to squeeze in these last one or two. Um, I know the folks want to hear from you. Um, how do you think patronage should support artists? Ooh, open your purse. 
sorry, <laughs> but like <laughs> quite not. literally, if you see a cool artist and they're like, oh, I'm selling stickers, pins, buttons, I have works on paper, um, I will do a drawing, I have canvases out, buy it. Um, I also think I'm a big advocate, like Stewie said, for um, like, if you're if you're not gonna buy work that's gonna help pay the bills, like buy some supplies, like offer to like support in some just different fashions. The Venmos, Cash Apps, PayPal's are all open. Like um, donations are a real thing to artists. Um, and then even if you're donating to like artist collectives, that also gets distributed out. So if you think about, especially in Charlotte, like nonprofits that do work such as like Crown Keepers, like that money goes out to creative. Um, or like Charlotte is creative, they accept donations because they have micro grants that go straight out to artists who need it. Um, Arts and Science Council has grants that go straight out, out to artists. Um, so there's various ways to fund and um, really give back to artists. And whether that's financially or like through opportunities, um, I think networks are super important to na uh, navigate, especially now in a time of COVID, but then also because of social media. Um, like if you know someone who works with or has work um, that has or that their collection is super nice, like connect an artist with them. Or um, if you know X, Y, and Z that works for the Mint Museum, like connect an artist with them. Um, especially if you think they're young, they or like they're just like a really cool artist and they have a lot of potential or could just learn from that connection. I'm a big advocate for learning as a source of income. Yeah, and you know, on on either side of that. So, look, it's no, it's no, it's no secret. Uh, art in schools is not supported, especially in early education. So, if you're pulling your kid out of a school because of you know you have a problem with the way they teach math or the way that the sports program is going, you should also be looking at the way that they support or don't support the arts, right? So, um, there's a way in which, like, you know us and our network, uh, you know, being Davidson grads and sort of the people that came before us, we're in positions to sort of push anyone from the, you know, the school board to local government, whoever it is to really put, you know, put, put, put their like, not just their pockets, but their, their advocacy, their, their sort of energy, their time, their, their professional sort of experiences behind the cultural movements, you know, um, and then on the other end of that, when you're talking about established artists, when you're talking about people who might be, you know, later on in their career, um, there's ways that someone who has experience in the field of law can really help um, artists understand how to, to maintain ownership of their work, right? You, there's, there's a platform called Creative Capital where they'll help um, artists in the Bay Area understand, um, you know, legal procedures or sort of you know, how to sell artwork or whatever it is, but this is all like nonprofit stuff. You know, what happens if more people are getting involved that work in finance spaces, that work in publishing spaces, that work in, you know, um, contracts, whatever it is. If you offer your services to young musicians, young actors, young um, painters, you can help us sort of, you know, as Michaela said, the, the knowledge is important, but then also having the backing of someone that's established and experienced is also just as good. And then, you know, like go out, support, um, literally spread the word and then also show up, right? Museums collect um, admissions fees for, for a reason, right? But beyond that, you know, go to a local um, gallery opening, go to the, um, you know, if in your city there's a first Fridays or if there's an art walk or something like that. And if you're not gonna buy something, bring two people who might, you know, but really make it a community effort and, you know, no one person is going to change this game. It kind of has to become a, a very much of a cultural sort of conscious decision, which is why the public art piece is so important. It really puts it in front of you. But yeah, you know, um, in the same way that you would get upset if your local government was doing something with your water or with the roads, if they're not supporting the arts, you should be as, you know, as concerned because again, a lot of times when there's significant um, upheaval in the world, people turn to the artists for that, you know, that easing of the burden of the stress to find beauty, to find enjoyment. So, you know, get out there and do what you can. And to add on to that, social media, uh, like just 
pubbing is huge. Just like tagging an artist on Instagram, if you happen to take a picture in front of their work, or if you see work that you like, tag them, um, because you never know who in your network is going to see that work. And then, like Stewie said, bring to pay for it. If you're, if, like, you cannot. Wonderful. All right. We will not get to all the questions. They keep coming. So I'm going to ask one last one to kind of maybe tie it together into to your share Davidson connections. Um, and so maybe think of um, a skill or a mentality uh, that your art has honed that you're able to apply to other disciplines of study or even just to your day to day life. Um, and then a note from this um, participant says, keep holding it down, my Davidson family. Say this last part. <laughs> I'll let you take that one, Michaela. You can start. I've been waiting for this one. Um, basically, okay, so as a biology and studio art double major graduate, I have seen just consistently how much art connects to the sciences. I know we have separated them socially as being two parts of your brain, which they are, but like not really, because as, as we already know, um, and we process things in our brain just very seamlessly across both the spheres. And so yes, some of our nerves, neurons are geared towards specific parts of that thinking process. They're the same processes. So we think of like the scientific method and how we conduct research, same thing as the creative practice. It's all about asking yourself a question, doing the preliminary research to figure out how to answer that question, going through that research to understand like, okay, well, let me try this well, okay, that didn't work, let me try this, to ultimately end up to a final result. And sometimes that result also isn't even like that, it's not what you're expecting. And that happens the same in science. Sometimes that result is not what you want, but it's that research that helps you build upon the next research or the next experiment or the next, you can publish that stuff like in science. So you can publish that information. In art, you can showcase that work. Um, that research process, that thought process is, just so valuable that intellectual labor that comes with being an artist is so so valuable um and so i've understood uh from very early on just how in interconnected they are um and just how easy it is to also express um biological and just like in general concepts through visual mediums so through slides if i'm looking at different cells human anatomy if i'm looking at the body and then also how that plays into figure study like it's just it's all it's all looped together. And then in a general and a different aspect of it, um, as an athlete, there's also a process of practice and development. So if I'm at practice and I'm not doing what I need to in long jump, that's practice. I'm supposed to fail at practice. In my book, I'm supposed to fail in my sketchbook. Like this is where it's okay because this is my practice. Like this is my field. Um, and so I can practice there. And it's a developmental process of working the same muscles to try and understand um, what it is that needs to work out. So if I'm practicing faces and portraiture, I just draw 100 noses over and over and over again. It's the same thing of putting in your 10,000 hours to understand and uh, really grow at whatever process you're trying to develop. So through art, sports, science, it's the same thing. Yeah, and, um, you know, I had a lot of those sort of experiences too coming out of Davidson. I remember a lot of people were confused when I told them I liked physics. And why would I put myself through that, especially at Davidson, where it's one of the harder sort of subject areas. But the way that things move and relate to each other and the way that they exist in space, 1000% is relevant to art practice, right? You don't construct anything without having an appreciation for gravity. That will collapse on you, right? You have to appreciate the way that um, liquids mix, whether it's water and oil, whether it's pigment and some kind of medium. So, you know, there's that part of it. But I would say for me, teaching has been the number one biggest sort of benefit to my art practice. I was painting a mural in um, Allen Book Elementary the year after graduating from Davidson. And, you know, the kids are hearing there's this artist coming to help them out. And they saw my video on YouTube. So in their heads, this is like this person is supposed to be good at what they do. I'm doing the sketches with chalk to outline the painting. And, you know, the kids, they don't, they don't get that part of it. They, they weren't really appreciative of the whole layering process and the washes that you have to do. And I, I kid you not, this fifth grader comes up and says, man, I thought you were supposed to be good. Like you suck. 
because the painting that he was looking at wasn't what he expected. And for me, you know, when you think about it, they're not going to hold back. So teaching, teaching, teaching for me, 1000% had to toughen me up. That's where I knew that I couldn't, I couldn't pull a fast one on any of the kids. They, they're going to tell you how it is, but also I have to figure out how to communicate with them. I can't go to the high level sort of, you know, super intellectual, conceptual, um, rationalization for why I made a thing because that keeps the art space very insulated, right? That keeps it just within the people that know or the people that have had access to the information. You gotta keep it open enough to those who are coming at it for the first time. You have to let the novices and the experts find their entry point. And so if I'm teaching some students about some concept in art history and they don't wanna be in that room, my job is to make it engaging and entertaining, not just in what I say, but the images I show them. Can I show them an artist that's from their part of the world that will show them how to appreciate what I'm talking about, even if they don't like why I'm talking about it, right? And that's the same thing in art. You know, you don't get to stand there next to your work in a museum. You have to create something that without you or with you there, someone can really appreciate that thing and it can have the desired impact on the world. So, you know, building your communication skills and then craft. A lot of people like good ideas and a lot of people are too lazy to make things well. If you don't make, if you don't do what you do to the best of your ability, I don't think you, are, you have any reason to complain when someone overlooks it, right? I can say something is a bad idea, try again, but if you made it well, I'm gonna give you your credit, your credit, right? And I think everyone can appreciate that. There's no coach that ever saw a hardworking kid and said, look, I don't want you on my team. They might not win, but the coach wants that kind of work ethic around, right? There's no teacher that's going to brush aside a kid who is trying and trying, but just because they don't get it, because they appreciate the effort. And I think it's the same with art. I can't expect you to pay me however much money my art will be worth now or in the future if I'm not putting in 110% to make that the best object possible. So, you know, that's sort of, that's sort of where I'm coming at this from. That's a good question. Appreciate it. Well, and again, thank you both. There, there remains more that I, and I know we're over. And so I, I am so grateful for your time, for your extra time. I'm grateful for all the questions. I'm sorry, folks, that we can't get to all of them. Um, I'm hoping I can ask Mikhail and Stu if you'd be comfortable that we'll share your information in any follow-up communications. So hopefully folks can ask questions of you that way. Um, Absolutely. Wonderful. And so, um, Again, can't, can't thank you both enough truly for this evening. It, it's been just lovely to be a fly on the wall listening. <laughs> I feel so honored and um, I'm hoping uh, and I'm, I'm sure others feel the same way. I um, also wanna extend a thank you to the class of 2015 reunion committee for, for suggesting um, and, and Stewie for bringing Michaela along. Grateful, um, grateful that he had that wonderful idea. <laughs> Um, and so um, thanks to everyone for joining. Uh, we are grateful for you spending your time with us this evening. Again, we'll send a follow-up communication tomorrow with some information for how to connect with Stewie and Michaela and wish everyone a wonderful evening. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, guys. See you next time. <laughs>